Well, welcome everybody to uh, to our next Nexus webinar. I'm uh, so honored and so excited to be able to have with us uh, Josh Howard from uh, Central India Christian Mission. Um, he's a he, he's a great dude that's been uh, that I've been introduced to just last summer when um, Nexus started the bivocational and co-vocational toolkit. It's just a little side training that we've been doing for some of our our bivocational co-vocational guys, and uh, he's just been been introducing us. And, and training us to with uh, some incredible disciple making movement tools that are are really being used all over the world and just gaining ground for the kingdom and um, just simple reproducible tools that have been um, incredibly effective in, in, in helping people come to Christ and equipping them to lead others to come to Christ. So Josh, thank you so much for being on the call, man. Yeah, it's awesome to be here, Andrew. Thanks for having me. Love you guys at Nexus. And so really really excited to be on here with you. Awesome, man. Well, I, I would like to just kind of maybe step back for a little bit and maybe just get just a, a little bit of a, of a backstory about a about a, a dude that grows up in the Midwest and moves to India and marries a, an Indian gal uh, and gets, how, how did you get involved with Central India Christian Mission? And just give us a brief overview of what, what was that process like? Yeah, I mean, that's a long story. I'll try to keep it super short, but uh, basically, man, so I grew up in church. Um, I, uh, I, from a young age, really felt called in a ministry, but I always thought that was going to be like, get a church in America, be a pastor, be a preacher. You know, that's, that was kind of the, the, I don't know, the, the pathway that I thought that I was going to be on. And then when I got to college, that's really when God began to kind of lift my eyes off of America and onto the nations and really began to dream about what, you know, uh, what God could use us for if, if, you know, we really went to unreached areas and, and places that had a lot of lost and broken people, right? Um, and so it was in college that I really began to pray and think about what this might look like to go overseas. I had no idea where that would be. I remember the, the head of it all was I was at ICOM, the International Conference on Missions in Indianapolis, Indiana. I was sitting in a session, don't remember the preacher's name, don't remember his sermon, okay? I remember him quoting somebody else. Isn't that how God works? Like, you don't, like, it makes me feel real great as a preacher of what people are going to remember that I say. But anyway, and I never heard this quote before. Apparently, it was a pretty famous quote. I just never heard it. And God, uh, the guy said, if you had but one light to burn, would you rather burn it in a land filled with darkness or one glowing with light? Hmm. And that night when they gave the invitation, man, I absolutely sprinted forward. I was just like, okay, God, I don't care where I'm at, what I'm called to do. I want to, I want to go to the darkest, most difficult places and, and take your, uh, take your name there, whatever that looks like. Right. So yeah. in my hotel that night, I'm praying, I'm thinking, I'm asking God what he wants. Right. And all I hear in my heart, Andrew, okay, this, you're going to like this. All right. All I hear in my heart after surrendering everything to Jesus was, Josh, I don't need you. Wow. I'm like, what? Like, I just surrendered everything, God. Like, how many people you have doing this, right? Like, like uh, I thought you said your workers are few, man. Like, I, <laughs> what do you mean you don't need me, right? Um, but then after letting me sit in that for a moment, God followed that up with this. And he said, Josh, I don't need you, but I need you to know that I want you. And there's a difference. Yeah. There's a difference between being needed and wanted by God. We aren't needed, but we're wanted. And that's even better, man. It's better to be wanted by the most high God. And so in, in I guess in order to keep my pride in check that night, all right, God let me know, listen, man, I could call a thousand other people better than you. All right. I don't need you. It's not like I'm like begging you to do something, right? But, but I want you and I want to use you. And so if you're willing to humble yourself before me, Josh, like you just need to know you're wanted, not needed, right? Yeah. And so the next day, bro, literally 12 hours later, I meet the guy, a guy named Mike Shragi, who's now the director of Good News Productions. And he talked about this internship of going overseas to eight different countries. And so I applied, got the internship, once again, so that I wouldn't get prideful, I found out I was the only guy who applied. So no, no pride involved there either, because it's not like I beat out 100 other applicants, all right? So I was the only guy that applied, another, another God moment there. 
And I went overseas for three months and traveled to eight countries. And that whole trip, man, I was praying and asking God, God, where do you want me? Are any of these countries where you want me to be? And when I got to India, that's really when I just felt a burden on my heart for that nation. It's when I met the woman who's now my wife. Uh, I didn't know it at the time, obviously, but that's when we met, was on that first trip to India. And uh, anyway, I've been there now 13 years, man. Um, wow. Been pretty crazy. And that's how I got connected with Central India Christian Mission. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, Tell us a little bit about that. What's, what's uh, Central India? What are, what do they do? How long have they been around? Um, yeah. So there? my, my father-in-law, my wife's dad and, and, and uh, her mom started this ministry about 40 years ago now, uh, doctors, Ajay and Indu Lal. And it started out as a church planning ministry. I mean, that's what they were focused on doing. And uh, now 40 years later, man, I mean, there are, I don't know, three or 4,000 churches that are a part of the CICM network on any given Sunday, there's between 600 and 700,000 people, uh, that are, you know, meeting in, uh, uh, a CICM church. We also have like children's ministries and my wife leads a children's home and orphanage with over 150 kids. I'm married way up, bro. Like my wife's like, you should honestly have her on here anyway. Um, <laughs> Uh, she's a lot prettier than me too. So, um, but uh, so we have a children's ministry. We have a church planting school that I'm helping lead where we're trying to raise up as many church planters as we can. And then we have a ministry called Ignite that we started. That's really about movements. It's about making disciples who make disciples, who make disciples and planting churches that plant churches that plant churches. And bro, listen, in 2020, man, we saw as an organization the most fruit we've ever seen in the history of our organization. Like, I mean, in the midst of a pandemic. So CICM saw over 50,000 baptisms last year, okay? In, in the midst of a pandemic, crazy numbers. Through Ignite, through our microchurch, uh, house church multiplication, we saw over 1,300 churches started last year uh, just by multiplying disciples who were multiplying house churches, crazy, crazy stuff, man. Um, and so God's moving in remarkable ways in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of difficulty, just, just really, really awesome. Really cool. Yeah, no, you were, um, I think you were sharing some of those statistics, even just a, a month or so ago with some of our guys. And um, I was really kind of blown away. But my, I think my initial question, and, and even at that time was, what what has kind of led to such a drastic increase in that? Because I think you showed um, either an infographic or something like that, or shared some statistics of, you know, from you know back early two thousands up until recently, there was like two thousand churches planted. Or, I mean, you you probably know you know the numbers better than I do. But um, and then just over the last like two, three, four, five years, or however long it was, like there's just some been some dramatic increase in the multiplication of what's going on and and i want you to just kind of give us a, a high level of what that has looked like numerically but then also what is what has it taken to actually really ramp that up and get into that yeah absolutely um so yeah if if you look at basically from the uh yeah the early 2000s there was about a total of about 1500 churches planted at that point around around that number i'm i'm kind of generalizing. I, I can't remember the exact amount that was planted since 1980 something until uh, early 2000s. So we're talking 20 something years, right? Um, and then in the last six years, we've seen over 5,500 started just in the last six years. So God has just radically shifted stuff in some remarkable ways. And a lot of that, I mean, there's a lot of stuff we attribute that to, but the majority of it are, are really a couple things, okay? One is, and we can go into some of these things, Andrew, like whatever you think would serve your people the best, we can chat about. But one yeah. of the main things was we really started massively traveling and training and equipping as many of our people as possible. Ordinary people, I'm not talking about just our leaders, ordinary people in our churches to actually be disciples who go make disciples. So how can they go... Basically, what we were trying to do is get all hands on deck. How can we get every single person to 
take up the burden and the responsibility of being witnesses for Jesus, ambassadors for Christ. Because Andrew, in the traditional world, man, in the traditional Christian world, it's so easy for everyday Christians to outsource their identity to professional ministers. Yeah. So what I mean by that is this. It, biblically speaking, every Christian is an ambassador of Christ. That's who we are. It's our identity. And it's very easy for us as everyday Christians to say, no, you're that. You're going to be the ambassador for our church as the pastor. Or the Bible says that we are witnesses, right? Uh, that we are witnesses of Jesus. No, you'll be the witness. Or 1 Corinthians says that we are ministers of reconciliation. That's what we are. Reconciling God and man together again. That's part of our ministry. And we say, no, 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 no. That's the professional pastor's job, the evangelist job, whatever. You're the minister of reconciliation, right? So it's super easy for us as everyday Christians to outsource our identity to professional ministers. And what we wanted to do is say, no, we've got to reclaim the identity of every believer, that they are ambassadors, they are witnesses, they are ministers of reconciliation. They are disciples who are called by God to make disciples, right? They are spirit-empowered believers, man, that have the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead inside of them, like every one of them, not just the yeah. leaders and pastors and church planners, every person in our church. And so... About six or seven years ago, we started traveling with this radical 2,000-year-old idea, okay, that every single person needs to be involved in this, in, this, in this movement. And so we tried to train as many ordinary people as possible to get out there, share their faith, make disciples, and start churches and homes and in coffee shops and in, you know, under mango trees, wherever that they could meet. Um, and we just saw... God do incredible things. He loves to do extraordinary things through ordinary people. And yeah. that's what we saw over and over again. So that's one thing is that we tried to really basically do the Ephesians 4 task. Ephesians 4 says, it talks about the apest, the apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd, teacher, all that. We don't need to get into that right now. But uh, it says though, that our main job, no matter which one of those we are, is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. So yep. professional ministers' main job is to equip the saints. That's what we're called to do. And so we say a lot in the movement world, the difference between ministry and movement is that ministry is a few people doing all the work. And movement is a lot of people doing a little bit of work all at the same time, yeah. right? So if I've got one guy that's the evangelist of my church and he's on staff and he's reaching a hundred people a, a week or whatever, he, uh, whatever it is, not that many, probably like 20 a week or whatever. But then if we've got 200 people that are each reaching two people a week, that's way better. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and so when we started training and equipping like that, man, we saw massive, massive differences. And so it really came down to releasing the priesthood of all believers and, and releasing authority and their commission and their identity back into the hands of everyday people. And that's where so many massive changes took place. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think, um, uh, help, help for a second. And let's, let's just kind of talk about the, the differences, um, not just culturally, but just even ministerially from, from what it looks like in, for you guys in India versus maybe what, um, American church kind of looks like. So when you're saying you're planting these thousands of churches, uh, just help me with this real quick. Just give me a, a good definition of what you guys consider church. Like, so when we, when we talk about church planting, especially in the U S I mean, we're, we're talking about filing a 501 C three with the IRS. We have a, a board of directors we have all these different things in place all these yeah, layers which are which what? are all very biblical things right <laughs> i'm just joking around. yeah I'm just around. i know they're needed here i'm joking guys right right, right. don't, don't so, send me nasty emails i know i know all right <laughs> <laughs> but we're all these all these ideas of what we call church. So give me give me a definition real quick of what you guys call call church. When you're talking about multiplying these disciple makers and planting churches, what is what do you what are you how do you define that? Yeah, absolutely. So we try to keep things as as simple as absolutely possible, right? We want to keep things uh and and that's part of movement, man. It's it's they have to be simple, they have to be reproducible, they've got to be biblical. Those are kind of the three pillars of reproducibility, I guess, or, or movement is really simple, reproducible, biblical stuff. 
And so when we talk about churches, we're talking about a group of people that have Jesus at their center, obviously. He's king and Lord of their lives. So that's one big difference. Let me stop here for a second. That's one major difference between what we see in America and what we see in India is that Indians just do lordship a whole lot better than Americans do. Okay. Like, like if they hear, for example, if they hear, um, here, hold on. My daughter just walked in. Hey baby, here, come on. You can come up here with me and we can train together. Okay. Um, so anyway, if we, if yes, honey, I'm here. Will you go in here, please? I'm sorry, guys. No worries. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) it's real life Zoom in real life yeah right real life real life dad stuff um but she's too adorable i can't really say no to her so um so anyway um the whole idea of lordship is actually obeying jesus with our lives okay like he is king and whatever he says i'm gonna do it as quickly as possible we call it the mary principle whenever if, if you guys remember the uh uh, the, uh, the, the first miracle at Cana, right? When Jesus turns water to wine, Mary brings the people to Jesus, right? And, uh, and what does she say to them? Whatever he says, do it. That's what she says. Whatever he says, do it, right? And so the whole idea is that we've got to have um, that mindset of making sure that we are doing whatever Jesus says as quickly as absolutely possible. And as Americans, usually, even me, when Jesus directs me to do something or I read it, my immediate response is arguing. It's not obedience. Like I try to come up with ways that I'm not going to do that and why it's not important and why I shouldn't do it that way or whatever. The Indian believers, man, when Jesus says something, they're ready to do it. They're not arguing. They're not questioning. They're just doing what he says. And, yeah. and that has been a major, major difference. So for us, a church is a group of people that have said, Jesus is my king. He's my Lord, not just my savior. I'm not just going to take forgiveness and grace. I'm also going to take his lordship and kingship on my life. Okay. So it's a group of people that have Jesus at their center who are focused on three main things. Okay. They are focused on loving God, loving people and making disciples. Okay. Okay. And I know that sounds super simple, but that's the whole Bible and three commands. Okay. Jesus said the whole old Testament is love God, love people. Okay. And the whole new Testament pretty much can be summed up, summed up and go make disciples of all nations. That's basically the book of acts forward is their obedience to that command. right? Right. And so it's love God, love people, make disciples. And so a church is the group of people that have committed their lives to that. Now to add to that, we also talk about, it's a group of people that are also fu- also functioning as a church. So we look at Acts chapter two, what were they doing? Dedicating themselves to the apostles' teaching, the breaking of bread, prayer, all those things. And so we want them to be, no matter how big or small they are, we want them to be a group of people that are baptizing locally, they're meeting together, worshiping together, breaking bread together, Lord's Supper, they're being generous with their time and their money, they have local leadership that's helping guide and coach and mentor them and disciple them, um, that's what church looks like. It just doesn't need a building. It doesn't need a budget. It doesn't need all that stuff. And the cool thing about this is that the majority of these churches that we're starting, man, are zero budget. It takes very little money to lead a church like that when you don't need all this other stuff going on. Um, yeah. so anyway, we could talk a lot about church, but that's kind of, yeah, sure. I have a, a couple of questions in the in the chat, kind of about just uh, some of that dichotomy of what 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 American church is like, what what Indian church is like. A uh, question here is, what is your assessment of how the church is doing here in America, and um, just that that idea of, and I think you even mentioned this on a training call earlier. Um, uh, uh, either earlier this week or last month that you were you were talking about how even a lot of the nations of the, how we've talked about going to all the nations because America is so saturated with stuff like that. But now there's been a recent, maybe not even recent, but a something coming down the pipeline for a while where it's just kind of flipped where we've had not only all the nations like right on our doorstep, but um, there's just a lot of darkness that's kind of come back into uh, that, that idea of where, where America is like even going back to that quote where, you know, being a light that shines only in a dark place, like, America is kind of becoming that again. So maybe just kind of speak into that. What's what's kind of your assessment of the church, how that's kind of going right here? And and I know that you're you're in Savannah right now. Is that right? 
Yeah, I'm in Savannah, Georgia right now. Mm-hmm. We've been here for two months. Yeah. Yeah, you do a lot of a lot of coaching, a lot of uh, work with uh, churches locally. So just kind of give us that. What is your partnership there and what is your kind of take on the local church and what we need to know yeah. as American pastors? Yeah, man. So it, yeah, I'm in Savannah helping a, a church here uh, basically think through this whole idea. How, how can we how can we be uh, focused on making disciples that multiply, starting churches that multiply? What does that look like? And, and so we've been trying to lay a lot of foundational work here over the last couple months in, in Georgia. We're getting some great traction, man. God's catching, you know, God's catching the heart of a lot of people here, and, uh, and they're really moving forward well. Um, so all across America, absolutely, dude, there are, obviously, there are broken and lost people everywhere, okay? And so um, the whole idea of that quote was not necessarily that we need to just leave America to the, to the wolves. Uh, there, there are definitely places in, in America that desperately need the gospel. The problem, though, is, is that the majority of finances and people go to places in the world that there are already Christians. And my point and my call that God put on my heart a long time ago was to go to places that, it, especially areas that did not have Christians or any light at all to shine, Right. And so there, the, the problem is this, man, okay? The most recent studies show that 98% of Western Christians will die without ever sharing their faith with another human being, okay? Wow. So there are people that have the light, but they're hiding it under a bowl, right? Yeah. There are people that have the light in this nation, but they're keeping it to themselves. And so because of that, absolutely, there are millions of dark places all across our country, there are lost people everywhere. We desperately need this to happen. And I've seen post-COVID, man, such a greater hunger for disciple-making movements, church planning movements, microchurch, house church, that whole idea in order to spread and multiply disciples and churches, even in the United States. And I've got friends, man, that are seeing third and fourth generation churches started in America. They're seeing churches started in homes and coffee shops. They're seeing multiplication happen like that. I mean, it's, it's really incredible to see the hunger and the move of God in this nation right now. Um, and so that's, that's beautiful. So there's a, a beautiful piece of it. The negative piece of it is that most of the time in the United States, in the Western world, we really have trouble with this whole idea of disciple making and multiplication. And most of the time, it's for a couple of reasons. One is we have no system in place for this. We don't really know how to make disciples most of the time. I mean, we have churches, large churches that come out with studies that say, hey, we thought we were making disciples and we didn't. We have none, right? And so we don't know what to do. We don't know how to fix it. And then we have other churches that think they're doing it, but they're really not getting any disciples out of it, right? And so we think we know what we're doing. And then all of a sudden we don't get anything on the other end. And a lot of times what happens is, the form that we currently have as a church, like the, the models we use and our services and our systems and all of that tend to, at times, take the front seat rather than the function or the purpose for which we are created. And so what we try to talk about a lot in the movement world is allow the function and the purpose to take the front seat and the form or the models we use should follow that function or that purpose. And so when we look at if God's call to our hearts and and to the nations is to go make disciples who multiply, if that's our call, then if that's the purpose and that's the destination that God has, then our models and our forms and all the stuff that we do, our systems, our programs, and all of that should be to serve and push forward that vision that God has for the world. But so often we get it backwards where our model comes first, our form comes first, the systems and programs come first, and then we hope and pray we make some disciples out of it. But what ends up happening is most of the disciples we get are in spite of what we do instead of because of what we do, right? Yeah. So I I use the illustration a lot, Andrew, like if I had a, I'll just make this up, like if I had a cell phone factory, right? And one out of every thousand cell phones that came across my production line actually worked. I've got a business, bro. Like I wouldn't have a cell phone factory very long. Okay. The problem is, is that the church looks a lot more like that than a good production factory. Meaning we may get one or two great disciples out of a thousand or whatever, 
but it's not because of what we're doing. It's in spite of what we're doing. Something is broken. And what would it look like if we were actual disciple making factories? What would it look like if the majority of people that came through our systems and programs actually came out on the other end, disciples of Jesus that were living and loving and serving like him and making more disciples? That'd be a beautiful thing, man. Right. And so the whole thing we've tried to do in India and when we're working with churches in America is take a look and say, all right, how do we get the purpose first? How do we get the function and the calling of the church first of making disciples and then create forms and models that will actually serve that purpose? And maybe every now and then we'll get a few that come out on the other side that isn't very good. Like any cell phone factory may have a few duds at the end that aren't working or whatever. That's normal and okay, but it shouldn't be the majority. And most of the time in our churches, it's sad to say, but it's true. And this is globally, not just in the West, but most of the people that come on the other side of our programs and systems aren't really disciples of Jesus, right? So the system's broken somewhere and we need to take a look at, are we putting form before function? Are we putting the models and the methods before the purpose and calling for which the church is called, right? We need to think through that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, no, that's so good. I mean, of just reevaluating what your what your outcomes are based on what your everything that you put into it. I mean, we just put time and energy and resources and dollar after dollar after chasing certain things. And yeah, like you're saying, like just the the studies that come out and just say that, like, whoops, we didn't do it. Like, <laughs> I read one the other day, bro, that a lot of churches, if you talk about their seating, just the seating attendance in the church, it's like ten thousand dollars a seat. Like that's how much we're paying wow. okay, in a church is $10,000 per attendee. And it's like, holy cow, man, like something's broken here, right? Like something's messed up. We got to like, if I had $10,000 per person in India, bro, like, come on, s- send it over to me, bro. Like, I'll be, I'll be glad to take it. Um, but, uh, um, but the point is like, there are just some, some things that we need to rethink if we're really going to be about the things that Jesus called us to be about, Right. And, and we need to realign ourselves to be focused on those things. Yeah, no, that's good. I'd like to, uh, in, here in a, in a minute, I'd love for you to share just a couple, like what, so what is the process? What are the tools? Like, what are some of those simple things that you guys, we do this, this, and this, and, and this was really just paved the way for multiplication to really take place or movement to really take place where we are. So I'd love for you to do that in a second, but I have a, a question here and I'd like to maybe even lead you with the, the first part of your answer. But the question is, you know, what if people in your church don't want to be part of a movement and they just come to be fed? How do you say no to that? Or how do you, how do you deal with that? And I think I, I'd like to, for you to answer maybe and just tell one of the stories that you told in our trainings about how you, you gave this great sermon at a, at a church for, for this yeah. desire for multiplication <laughs> of hundreds. You to tell that story? Yeah, maybe even thousands. <laughs> but why don't, you, why don't you share that story with us real quick? And the All right, yeah. You got so, so when I first started dreaming about movement, right, and we started studying and getting as much stuff as I could, we were ready to launch. Like we were ready to get going on movement, multiplication, making disciples. And I was ready, bro. Like I... I had all this stuff in my pockets, you know, all these, all these weapons and, and every, I was ready to go, man. So I'm preaching at our church on Sunday in India. It's a large church. There's a, about usually between a thousand and 1500 people that attend. It was planted over a hundred years ago by missionaries. And, and so I'm preaching and dude, I'm ready. Like, I know this is going to be the best sermon I've ever given in my life. Like I just know it. Right. It's one of those, one of those moments. And so I'm expecting Pentecost Sunday, bro. Like, (laughs) <laughs> like I'm ready for a thousand people to come forward. Right. As a matter of fact, I was ready for 3000. Like I thought people on the streets were going to hear it and be like, dude, I'm in like, sign me up. Right. And uh, so I preached my heart out, man, cast in vision for movement and multiplication and disciple making and what we could do if we all join hands and did it together. Let's awaken the sleeping body of the church, man. Like I was, I was preaching it, bro. Like I felt the Holy spirit the whole time, you know, it was like an out of body experience. So after the service, right, I gave a call. Hey, come up after the service if you want to be a part of this. And, dude, I've got sheets of paper, like sheets after sheets after sheets of paper ready for people to sign up for this thing, right? And 12 people came forward out of, like, 1,500 people, okay, or 1,000 people. However many were there. 12 people, bro. Wow. 
And I got mad. I was like, are you people not Christians? Like, do you not want to do it? Jesus, you know, like I was so frustrated. And, uh, uh, I had a buddy sitting next to me that was like, uh, Hey, Josh, I know another guy that started with 12 people and he did all right. Right. Yeah. Um, and so it gave me some perspective. So we start training these 12 only. Right. So we left the other 99 to go after the one. Right. Uh, and so we're, we're training these 12, 11 of them did nothing. Okay. Nothing. So I had the opposite effect of what Jesus had. Like he had one guy that went away and was Judas. I had 11 of those guys. Okay. So I guess that's, that's about right. You know, uh, for, for me not being Jesus and everything, but I had one guy, bro, that was an uneducated village guy. Couldn't even hardly read or write. And after training him, man, in two weeks, started eight house churches in surrounding villages eight churches man wow like he was the super spreader of the gospel bro and let me tell you something man i would have never picked him on my team ever like if i was selecting people in the thousand that day he would not i promise like he would have been in my bottom like five you know what i mean like i wouldn't have picked him he wouldn't have been on my team and god calls him out man raises him up and uses him he's like the you know the gathering demoniac or the samaritan woman like this person that nobody probably would have picked that just went out there and spread the gospel like crazy. And it was that guy that was the proof of concept for me that ordinary people can do crazy stuff for the kingdom. And it was because of him that we started training as many people as we could, right? Yeah. And so to answer that question through this story, what do you do when people don't want to be a part of it? For me, man, I just, I let them keep doing what they're doing. Like there's no need to uh, we can keep challenging, we can keep preaching, we can keep talking like that, but there's no need to, you know, cast judgment. There's no need to be mean. There's no need to talk bad about them or anything like that. Really, some people like that, when they start seeing people actually start live this out, uh, living this out, and they start seeing fruit, and they start seeing God move, some of those same people that say, I don't want to be a part of that, when they start seeing what God is doing, all of a sudden it's going to be like, man, I, okay, what do I need to do to be a part of something like that? Right? Like I have guys on my team right now, Andrew, no joke. I've got one guy that is now in my main ignite team. He is in my 10 best guys on my team. He's seeing a movement in Andre Pradesh right now that is shaking the city. Okay. And, uh, um, he was a guy at the very beginning that wasn't for this whole movement thing. But when he started seeing what God did, man, he jumped in and, and got involved. And so I would say just focus your time and energy on those that are ready to jump in. Focus your time and energy on the few. Um, movement principles are, one of the movement principles is you got to go slow to go fast. And the point is, at the beginning, it is going to be slow going. There are going to be people who aren't ready to jump in. And you've just got to make sure that you're focusing on those that are being faithful and fruitful with what you're giving them. They're ready to jump out there and give this a try. And you want to focus on coaching and mentoring those people as best as possible. Yeah, no, that's great, man. Um, uh, as, as we kind of transition, I'd love, I'd love for you to introduce um, just a couple of, of, of really practical, how, uh, what, if, if we're, if somebody's sitting here today, how do we get started in this? Like, what are, what are one of those tools? What are two of those tools that we could just really easily be able to just gather some people together and start doing things? Cause that's one of the, uh, and, and also maybe even a warning to somebody who wants to maybe stand up on stage and, and cast a vision for literally everybody. And just, you know, maybe not going that route of just, like you said, starting slow, starting with a few. I think one of the phrases we use is going with the goers of like figuring out who who's willing to to look foolish and, and go try stuff and, and just really kind of go in in into what that looks like. But um, if you would just kind of walk us through maybe whether it's either the uh, a discovery Bible study, the three thirds groups, the four fields, like what are what's one or two tools that you would say like, hey, if you want to starting just to just to get the ball rolling, what do you do? Yeah, absolutely. Um, no, that's great. I mean, I would, I would highly recommend at the beginning, okay, before I get into any tools or whatever, I'd highly recommend to get a coach, somebody that's seeing this stuff happen, whoever it is, in, in a context like yours, who can walk you through this. I've got a bunch of friends, if, if you're in the United States right now, or in Europe, or wherever, I have a lot of friends that are doing stuff like this in your context. 
who would be glad to walk with you and, and coach you through this process. Um, and so my, my first recommendation would be, if you really want to jump in and get some stuff do, going, grab a coach that knows what they're doing, that can help you, that can walk with you, walk, you know, take your hand and walk with you through this process. Um, but as for tools, man, yeah, there are, so we talk about three main things when we're talking about movement all the time. And it's what we train almost everybody in. Okay. We talk about a big vision, a clear path and simple tools. Okay. Big vision, clear path, simple tools. The big vision idea that we talk about all the time is basically laying down your vision and picking up God's vision for your city, for your nation, for your state, whatever it is, rather than building our little kingdoms, what would it look like to build God's kingdom? And instead of asking, what do I want to do? Ask, what is it going to take to fulfill that vision? Not what do I want to do in ministry? What is my dream? Let's quit asking that question and start asking, what's it going to take to fulfill God's mission for this city, to, to fulfill God's heart for this nation? What's it going to take to see that type of stuff happen, right? And that's a whole different question. Yeah. So we talk a ton about big vision. And so I would encourage you guys at the very beginning, man, fast, pray, get into God's heart and really start dreaming about what God desires to do. Not what you want to do, not what your church wants to do, not what your leaders want to do. What does God want to do in your city and in your nation and see what that will look like when you join him in that work? It's a, it's a, it's a whole different paradigm shift. So I would say start there, man. Begin to pray and fast about what God desires and see how your life can fit into that. Secondly, clear path. If God has a vision, then we need a clear path to get to that destination. Because usually what got us here is not going to get us there. That's what we saw in India six, seven years ago. We knew that whatever got us to the point we were, which was amazing, like we were getting, we were getting amazing fruit and seeing a ton of churches started and a lot of people come to Christ. But when we started to look at what God's vision was for India, of every tribe, tongue, and nation, every village, every place, we knew that what got us there was not going to get us to that destination. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. And so you've got to make sure that you've got a clear pathway to get there. For us, that's the four fields, okay? The four fields is a, it was created in India by some friends of ours. All it is is an illustration showing the way the disciples and Jesus went about making disciples who multiply and starting churches, okay? And so that's, that's really all it is. So we talk, are you sharing it right now? Yeah, here we go. So this is, the, this is the four fields, okay? Entry, right up here in the corner, is all about entering into new, uh, a, a new field that is empty, or this could be new relationships, a new subdivision, a new city, a new village, whatever it might be, a new clique of people, a new sphere of influence, whatever it is, Okay. And that could be literally a new town or a new place or a new subdivision or a new apartment building. Or it could be like your bowling league on Thursday nights or, or like the, the, the parents of the kids on your baseball team. Like that's another group of people. You get what I'm saying? Like entry is just learning how to intentionally form relationships with people. So we talk about there's two types of lost people. Ones you know and ones you don't know. Okay. That's really it. All right. And so we try to teach people, make a list of the lost people that you know who don't know Jesus and start praying for them every day and asking God for opportunities. Super simple. And for people you don't know, start praying that God would lead you to people that are open to the gospel every day of your life. People you don't know. It's called a people of peace search or a person of peace search or a person of peace prayer. It comes from Luke 10 and Matthew 10. And it's just saying, hey, God, lead me to the people that are open to the gospel. That's an entry strategy, okay, to get into new people, new places, new areas, or people you know. That will lead to gospel. The gospel field is just where you begin to share about Jesus with people. And what, what this is, all we teach here is how to share your testimony and how to share a simple gospel presentation. That's it. You could, there are 50,000 gospel presentations in the world. Pick one that's good, that works, and use it. The best tools are the ones you use. Yeah. Okay. The best tools are the ones you use. I could give you a thousand tools. And if you don't use any of them, they all suck. All right. You need to use, pick one that you're going to use and use it. All right. Whatever it is, because 
doing something is better than doing nothing. All right. Even if it's a bad tool, I'd rather use a bad tool and do something than a good tool and not, not do anything with it. Um, and so you want to make sure that you're getting the gospel and making sure that you're opening your mouth. We say this all the time. Your harvest is in direct relation to the amount of seeds that you sow. Your harvest is in direct relation to the amount of seeds that you sow. Andrew, I've got pastors all the time, man. They're like, Josh, why isn't my church growing, man? You guys are seeing so much fruit in India. Like, why, why is my church not growing? I'm like, how many seeds are you sowing, bro? You know? And most of the time in the West, the truth is we just aren't sowing that many seeds. You know, we're not sharing our faith very much. Like somebody asked me once, what do you think is the big difference between American Christians and Indian Christians? And why are you seeing so much more fruit? I'm like, the Indians just share the gospel way more. Yeah. They're just they're just open their mouths more. And so when you throw more seed, you get more fruit. Like that's what happens. It's a natural, it's a natural thing. Yeah. And so often, right, we have entire parachurch ministries, bro. They're focused on like only one of these fields, like entry right. strategy. We're going to feed the homeless or we're going to have a, uh, like a, 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 like a, what is like a canned food drive or something, right? And feed families like that. But it never gets the gospel. And what do they do? They skip these other two fields and try to get people straight to church. So they skip, they skip the gospel, skip discipleship and try to get them to church. Or we've got parachurch ministries that are just about gospel. And what do they do? They invite people to church. Like, let's get people into church. And they're not discipling any of them. And then that's why this third field is down here is that it's about discipleship. And so it's about getting people into groups where they are learning how to be obedient followers of Christ, that are learning how to do what God's called them to do and become who's God's called, who God's called them to become. And so we have a lot of tools there, man. One of them is the one that you mentioned called the three thirds. All the three thirds is, is a group format. It's, it's a way to have a meeting. That's all it is. But yeah. the difference that the three thirds is, is that it naturally leads to people being wise builders rather than foolish builders. Okay. It naturally leads to people listening to the word and doing what it says. I use this example a lot, man. Like, we talk a lot about the why. Yeah, here's the three thirds here. Uh, thanks for jumping in there, bro. You're being awesome. I got you. <laughs> um, I don't have time to go through the whole thing here. We can send this out to you. Yeah. But basically, it's look back, look up, look ahead. And you can see over on the right side of look forward, we're actually setting goals every single week. How am I going to obey? Who am I going to train? And who am I going to share the gospel with? It's obedience, being a disciple first, training making disciples and sharing, telling people about Jesus. We, we set goals on those three every single time. And at the beginning, during the look back portion, we're checking up with each other to see, did we actually do this or not? Okay. Yeah. Now, when we talk about the wise and foolish builders, Andrew, what I say a lot, you know, I've heard a hundred sermons about the wise and foolish builders. Almost all of them go something like this. The wise man is him who builds his house on the rock. Build your life on Jesus. He's the rock. If you build your life on anything else, sex, money, power, fame, whatever it is, it's going to come crashing down. Build your life on Jesus, not on anything else. That's the sermon. And dude, that's a beautiful sermon. It's just not what Jesus was saying. <laughs> like, it's a true message. It's just not Jesus's message. And Jesus's point, his only point in that parable the wise man, he said, was the man who heard my words and put them into practice. He did it. And the foolish man was him who heard the words of God and did nothing with it. So according to Jesus, the foolish man is the guy who comes to church every week, listens to a sermon, and goes home and does nothing with what he learned. Or it's the pastor who every morning at 6 a.m., dude, on the dot, he's got his coffee cup and his Bible open, and he's reading scripture, but he's never doing anything that he reads. Or it's the wife on the way to soccer practice listening to sermon podcasts, but never does anything that she listens to, okay? Yeah. According to Jesus, that's the foolish builder, okay? And unintentionally, and I mean that, unintentionally, our traditional churches are designed or it creates an atmosphere that leads to foolish builders rather than wise builders, it creates an atmosphere where it's okay to listen and do nothing. Listen and do nothing. We come one week, we hear about one topic, we come back the next week, a completely different topic. 
no one asks us or even cares most of the time, did we do anything with what we heard last week? And the three thirds helps create wise builders. It's reading scripture, asking questions, and then setting goals. How am I going to obey this? What am I going to do with this? Who am I going to train people on? You know, what am I going to do to actually see this stuff take, take place in my life? And so the three thirds is a beautiful tool in the middle, in the look up, Andrew, right here. Yeah. That's a discovery Bible study. And so what that is, is we open a passage or a story, we read it or tell the story and then ask questions so that everyone can discover what God is saying and set goals about what they're going to do with it in their lives. Yeah. And so and at the is, bottom, real quick, is, Andrew. Yeah, yeah, this is pretty much what you guys do uh, at a core level in, in India when you're training people of just like, hey, like, open the word, read it, do what it says, set a goal, come back next week and we'll see how you did. And, and it's and like, is... it's like dumb, simple, man. Like it's simple. <laughs> it's super simple. And that's how movements happen, bro. If it's not simple, it won't reproduce. Like if, if my eight year old son can't do it and my 70 year old grandma can't do it, a movement won't start. Mm. And so like our kids have to be able to do this. Our grandparents have to be able to do this. Like Anybody and everybody needs to be able to do this if we're going to reclaim the priesthood of all believers. Like everybody has to be able. So at the bottom of this uh, document here, you can read at the very bottom what it says. It says the process is simple. The curriculum is the Bible. The teacher is the Holy Spirit. The priority is obedience. And the results is multiplication. And that's the key here, man. We're teaching everybody and their dog on how to lead a three-thirds group, okay? Like we'll train anybody and everybody. This is what our house churches do. This is what our small groups do. It doesn't matter. We are, we are doing three-thirds groups. And here's the crazy part, Andrew. Right now, there are 1, 000, over 1,300 movements being tracked across the world of, of rapid multiplication movements. All of them, all of them use some form of the three-thirds, all of them. Wow. And so God is doing something very special with just being simple, discovering what God says, putting it into practice immediately and holding each other accountable to it. There's something very special that God is doing through this process right now. And it's super beautiful. Yeah, that's amazing, man. Why don't you finish up uh, walking through the, the four fields for us real quick? Yeah. So discipleship is what we just looked at. We do three thirds in discovery Bible studies. And then that leads to gathering, which is church. Most of the time, we try to start a church and hope we get disciples. That's not what the disciples did. That's not what Jesus did. It's you get disciples, and that's what gets a church. If you start with a church in a service, you may get a disciple, maybe. But if you start with a group of disciples, you're going to get a church. Like, that's what a church is, right? It's a group of disciples that are being obedient followers of Christ. That's what it is. Yeah. So the church here... That's when we gather them together. We also do three thirds there. And we do this thing called a church circle to see if it's healthy or not. So is baptism taking place locally? Similar to what I talked about earlier. Are, yeah. there, are there local church leaders? Uh, are they worshiping together, praying together, that whole thing? And we want to make sure that it's, that's healthy. And then this middle field here called uh, multiplier leadership development, that's where we just want to make sure that people are being raised up and sent out to do this over and over and over again. The four fields needs to be a flywheel that keeps spinning over and over and over again. People are getting trained up to go to new relationships, new places, new fields to start the process over and over and over again. And it needs to be, I mean, we need to be having work going on in all four fields at all times. Like it needs to be an ongoing process as we go. So that's our clear path. And those are some of the simple tools that I mentioned earlier, right? So yeah. I said, big vision, clear path. All this is, bro, is how the disciples and Jesus did it. I mean, that's, that's what it is. It's just a good illustration about farming that most people understand. But the yeah. process is out of the book of Acts. It's out of the gospels. This is how Jesus and the disciples did it. They went to new areas, proclaimed the gospel, got the few and made disciples, formed churches out of it, and multiplied leaders. That's what they did. And right. so this isn't some like new, you know, this is a 2000 year old idea that we're just trying to imitate so that we can see similar results to what Jesus did. 
Yeah, no, I, I've, I think we were first introduced to this probably back in August at some point, maybe uh, maybe even July uh, with our, our bivocational training uh, for some of those guys. And you introduced this tool and I just was was kind of just floored again by some of the simplicity of it, where it's just like, oh, like that's that's all we do. But I think that maybe like you were saying that even in the American church, we have this idea of going entry straight to the gathering or straight to the church building. And we we omit that the whole right side of of understanding the and sharing the gospel and raising up disciples and how you care for and nurture people in a way that's not wholly dependent on the planter or the pastor. Right. And yep. so, um, but yeah, I mean, this has been uh, tremendously influential, I think in, in my own thinking about some of this stuff and especially in the role that I have of being able to be a, a trainer at Nexus, we've, we've revamped all of our, um, Art of the Start training, which is our our entry our of church planters that are getting ready to go out and and start a church, we've we've revamped all of that to be organized around the four fields of like what does it look like to enter into community? How do you identify locations that you can share the gospel? How do you reach neighbors and how do you teach others to do the same? What does what does gospel look like? How do we share the gospel? You know, using tools like you were saying, like the best tool is the one you use. So I think you know we we introduce our guys to the the three circles. Circles and and how you how you share the gospel through that, but training others to be able to share the gospel, and then you know discipleship tools like Discovery Bible Study or the Three Thirds Groups, uh, the Four One One training or whatever whatever other tools that we talk about, and then based on all of that, what then does the gathering actually look like? How does how do you actually utilize that time uh, for the purpose of all of this training that goes on and then you know just the centerpiece of multiplication how do we raise up leaders to reproduce this right yeah, yeah that's beautiful man yeah because so often bro it's like the pinnacle of success sometimes in our minds and and i don't think we'd ever verbalize this but it's just the way we naturally lean sometimes that the pinnacle of success or the or the pinnacle of our vision is like what happens on sunday morning sometimes and it's like man like that's like Sunday morning should be like the halftime locker room talk of what we're doing in the field. You know what I'm saying? Like it, it can't be the end all be all of this is what the church is called to do. Like, no, it's not like, not at all. This is like a time that we get energized on pat, you know, on vision again, on mission again, it's where we cast vision to one another and encourage each other in order to be launched back out into the community in order to change lives. Like, and so often we forget that and it becomes this like, you know, holy ingrown inbred thing that doesn't look anything like what Jesus dreamed of or what he gave his life for. And so we want to make sure that we are focused on the things that Jesus cares about, right? Like a quote that wrecked me, Andrew, a long time ago, it's a Leonard Ravenhill quote. And he said, you know, are the things you're living for worth Christ dying for, right? Are the things you're focused on worth the death of Jesus. Hmm. And dude, so often we as professional ministers are focused on things that if we're honest, it's not really worth the death of Christ. You know what I mean? And there are so many other things that sometimes take a back seat that are worth that, that we need to give everything for, right? And so we need to think about what is our main mission? What is the mission of the church, the big C church? What is God's vision for the world? And do we still serve the God that leaves the 99 to go after the one? Do we still serve the God that's searching under the table for the lost coin? Do we still serve the God that's stepping out on his front porch every day, looking for his lost sons and daughters to run home? And if we still serve the God that said, I came to seek and save the lost, then a major part of who we are needs to be accomplishing God's heart, right? Yeah. And, uh, and so anyway, that's, that's something that's challenged me over the years for sure. Yeah. What would you say um, to maybe those pastors that have, have, have kind of faulted in this area of uh, uh, kind of had a tendency towards the over, I don't know, the over glorification or the over focus on what, what Sunday morning church is and what it should look like? What would you say to them to help them realize that this, this really is what we were called to do? Um, yeah. and, and how do you maybe even repent from some of that thinking and just really start a movement back towards that, just that biblical simplicity of go and make disciples? Yeah. Uh, first of all, man, I would just say, I would, I, I try to encourage pastors all the time. 
I, I've had pastors that have really, some of them felt very broken after some of these conversations, almost feeling like everything they've done has been a waste of time or worthless. Yeah. And I try to speak over them that absolutely not. Like that is a lie from the enemy. Addition, traditional services, like addition minded traditional services have still changed lives, bro. Like they've still been a win for the kingdom. I grew up in a traditional, additional minded church, right? Like my pastor was so traditional, but he influenced me to go to the nations. You know what I mean? Like my point is that it's not a waste of time what we're doing. Okay. It's good stuff. And so what you've done, what you've done is honorable, good. I know you've had great intentions. I know your heart is good in those things. But what I would challenge you to think about is the decision we must make as professional ministers of the gospel is usually not a choice between good and bad. It's between good and best. And it, the question we must ask is, is my current model of ministry and system that I'm in going to help reach God's vision for my city? Or is it unintentionally hindering that vision from being completed? Okay. And am, am I willing to change my focus and my attention and set my eyes on the things that are really going to move the needle forward on touching lostness, touching brokenness, making disciples, empowering my people to go make disciples? Am I going to, am I going to be willing to lay my kingdom down to pick up his kingdom, my mission down to pick up his mission? Am I willing to do that, right? And that's a big question, man. It goes from, like I mentioned earlier, we have to change our question from what do I wanna do to what is it gonna take to fulfill that vision that God has? And if we're willing to honestly ask that question, it'll change the way that we think about ministry. And so I'd say two things, bro, at the end here to those pastors. Number one, You've not wasted your life. You've not wasted your time. You're doing incredible ministry. God is glorified. People are being touched and and souls are being saved. And that is a beautiful win for the kingdom. Will you now be willing to give some of those old systems up for something that could possibly, potentially reach even more people with the gospel, empower even more disciples to make disciples and see even a greater impact than what you've seen in the past with something that God is doing fresh in the world right now. Um, And so I want to honor what's been done in the past, but also challenge people to get their eyes onto the future, lift their eyes onto the future and see what God is doing. And it's crazy to get our eyes on the future. We actually need to look 2000 years in the past to, to, model and imitate what Jesus actually came to do. Right. Right. <laughs> um, which is crazy, but that's so good, man. So I'm so thankful for, uh, for your encouragement, for your words, um, just for, for your passion. Uh, I've been incredibly influenced by, uh, by, by you and your, your, just your, your teaching and just the, the simplicity and the passion that's there of just the, the simplicity of the tools, the desire to reach the nations, the desire to follow the call of God. And, um, uh, yeah, just want to say thank you for uh, just the investment that you've made for our for our Nexus leaders. And um, uh, yeah, just this thank you for your time this afternoon, man. Thank you so much. No, thank you, Andrew. And, and God bless you guys. If if I can be of any service to any of you guys listening, please let me know. Reach out to Nexus and they can connect you with me. But I'd, I'd be more than happy to help serve you guys in any way possible. And if you have any other questions or whatever, just just reach out. Awesome. Josh, thank you so much, man. I appreciate your time. Yep. God bless you guys. Thank you. Bye.